maybe Daniel, you you gonna say a couple of words and then I do introduction. Um, no, I think you can just get going. Okay, so I do just start introduction, right? Okay. Fine. So uh, yeah, when when do we start recording? Uh, oh, we already started, right? Okay, good. Yes, it's recording. Okay, it's recording. Good. So the speaker today is Igor Mazin. Um, Igor uh, received his PhD uh, in theoretical physics in 1984 at Lebedev Physical Institute, Moscow. Uh, and then he was uh, a staff member there. After that, after getting his PhD, that was the group of uh, theoretical group of Vitaly Ginzburg. And in fact, for a while, for several years, uh, Igor was uh, secretary of the famous Ginzburg seminar at the Lebedev Institute. Um, then in the early 90s, he moved to Germany and he worked at Max, Pl Max Planck Institute at Stuttgart. And then in mid 90s, he moved to the Washington DC area. And from 1998, uh, in 1998, he became a research scientist at Naval Research Laboratory. And he spent there almost 20 years, or actually more than 20, well, about 20 years then at NRL, uh, doing a lot of work on superconductivity. Uh, but then last year, 2019, um, he joined George Mason University in Virginia, where he is professor of practice in advanced studies in theoretical physics. So Igor is an expert in theory of superconductivity. Uh, in fact, he was a uh, theory panel leader of the Department of Energy Workshop on basic research needs for superconductivity and co-writer of the final document. Um, in 2018, uh, he was awarded John Bardeen Prize for, quote, theoretical work that has provided significant, significant insights in the nature of superconductivity and has led to verifiable predictions. He has, of course, uh, many papers, and for several years he was uh, recognized as a highly cited researcher by Web of Science. So, anyways, we are really fortunate to have uh, this uh, great expert in superconductivity to tell us about Ising superconductivity in niobium selenium 2. Uh, material I heard about in my youth when I was doing my PhD, but of course I didn't know it actually the superconductivity is Ising superconductivity, and there was no monolayer at that time. So anyway, Igor, floor is yours, so please go ahead and start. Okay, thank you, Victor. Thank you for inviting me again to your uh, highly regarded seminar. I think it's my sixth or seventh time, but the first time uh, in this virtual mode with no dinner afterwards, so uh, sad reality. So in addition to what uh, Victor said, uh, my main occupation is first principle electronic structure calculations. And uh, whatever insight I derived in superconductivity, I usually um, derive from, um, from actual material side. But I don't think you are here uh, mostly to um, listen to this particular side, although it will also be presented, of course. I'm pretty sure that a good fraction of you just heard the word of Isaac superconductivity and knew that it's another buzzword recently, but didn't really have time to go deeply into this and wanted somebody to present a plain and uh, easily understandable view of what is going on there and why it is interesting. Now, I'm not uh, pretending that I'm going to tell you everything that you want to know. Uh, why somehow? I cannot, okay, now it works. Um, so I will tell you something that you may have wanted to know about Isaac superconductivity, uh, and it will be broken into two pieces because uh, I will try to argue that uh, many of interesting and intriguing effects that people associate with Isaac superconductivity actually uh, have roots in the interesting normal property of the spin orbit material with broken inversion symmetry. Then we'll um, talk a little bit about the super some aspects of superconductivity itself, including some uh, recent experimental data provided courtesy of um, PHI-MAC uh, and uh, how do we believe we understand them. Before proceeding, I want to address uh, the one painful issue for all of us because this work, I think, is a good example of how we all mostly function and we are international community which doesn't know borders, uh, contrary to what some of our leaders want to believe, and in particular players in this uh, little game that I may present uh, come from all sides of the world, 
uh, Daniel Ekterberg, if you may or may not know, is a Canadian. Um, he was, um, we were um, deeply engaged with him and working on this. Uh, Darshana Vikramaratne, um, who uh, used to be um, my postdoc at NRL, but now he's a full-time employee, research visitor there, um, comes from Sri Lanka and now uh, resides in Washington. Uh, there are other people who contribute to this work. Uh, Sergei Kmielewski, who came from Ukraine and is now in Technical University of Wien, did some calculations for us. Roxana Margin, um, for originally Romanian, uh, is working on um, electron phone coupling investigation for this novum diselenite monolayers. Uh, and uh, a lot of understanding came from um, a good friend and colleague, Maxim Kodas, who um, is now uh, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And of course, myself, as you know, by way of Germany, I come from Moscow and ended up in Washington. So uh, here we are. And let me now go to uh, the um, actual material, because in my view, everything starts from material. So the material in question, there are several other, but this is by far the one most studied, is a uh, single layer novium diselenite. Why is it important to have a single layer? As you can see, uh, in a single layer, there is no inversion symmetry. If you try to put inversion symmetry at, an, um, at a metal ion, uh, it doesn't work. If you try to put it in the needle, it doesn't work either. However, in the bulk, inversion symmetry is restored because you have inversion symmetry located right between the layers. And you can see clearly that despite each layer uh, lacking inversion symmetry, this operation converts one layer into the neighboring layer. So again, as you know, for non-magnetic material, without inversion symmetry, um, Kramer's uh, degeneracy is preserved. That means that uh, you may have to define um, pseudo spin instead of a real spin. Uh, but in any event, your uh, each electronic state will be double degenerate with respect to um, Kramer's operation, which is symmetry, which is a time inversion operation. Uh, now, uh, a monolayer uh, does not work this way. Mm. By the way, um, going back to this um, bulk layer or double layer for that matter, uh, that all the, already ho has bonding antibonding splitting. And there's no additional splitting. So you still have two uh, states, but each state is uh, Kramer's degenerate. In this case, it is not. And um, as this uh, picture shows, if you go from gamma point, uh, towards the direction of the K point, the spin orbit splitting gradually uh, increases and reaches maximum at K point. And then along uh, gamma M line, it's absent. Um, it's actually easy to understand why does it happen. And we'll do that in the next moment. Uh, one thing to, uh, important to emphasize is the exchange splitting um, uh, on this Fermi surface or even in this Fermi surface, except of not the line, is much larger than the superconducting gap. So it can be um, considered from superconductivity point of view, a strong, uh, strong um, spin orbit coupled um, material, even though it's, uh, um, it's not that large as in, um, say, iridate or some other materials. So this is the similar band structure presented in a different way. On the right, you see the um, uh, pseudo spin resulting from the calculations. And you can see that there are no uh, shades there, no nuances. It's either red or uh, deep blue, uh, meaning that uh, in the calculations, um, the pseudo spin is always directed either uh, along the z axis or opposite to z axis, but never canted or tilted. And to understand that, we need to look at the orbital composition <coughs> of these bands. So these bands are, um, there is strong crystal field splitting, which leaves us with um, the uh, three, um, three T to G orbitals. Uh, the real orbitals are X square minus Y square, X, Y. Uh, actually not, it's a, it's a, it's a bit different. It's a, it's, a, it's a trivial splitting, but that's what uh, are the three orbitals that are coming to game here. Uh, and you can also see that the character uh, at gamma point is purely Z squared, and then it gradually uh, gets more and more X square minus Y square and X, Y character admixed. Uh, why is it important? So let us look at the wave function at an arbitrary point. 
So it can be described as linear combination of these three cubic orbitals. Now, if you look at these orbitals in um, uh, spherical harmonic basis, so this one has orbital moment of zero, and these two are combination of orbital moment two minus two, and um, <clears throat> so uh, odd and even combination of these two harmonics. Now, because we have a Z minus Z mirror symmetry, then this state don't have any um, even, um, oh, sorry, it's a typo, no, uh, only even states in M, so you don't have X, um, Z or Y, Z orbitals. Because of that reason, if you try to, um, to calculate the expectation value of or matrix elements or orbital momentum operator, um, the L plus minus matrix elements are zero because you only jump by two and they are raised by one. Now there is diagonal element, of course, but if you calculate diagonal element, it appears that it's, uh, um, it's equal to or proportional to this coefficient times imaginary part of this coefficient um, minus um, the convert. Uh, there is always freedom to choose a phase. So we can always ch choose a phase so that um, eta would be real, one of them, but not both of them, except the log gamma m where the symmetry allows you to select um, coefficients so that both of them are real. And in that case, uh, there's um, the uh, expectation value of, um, of the orbital momentum operator is zero. But as we go along uh, away from gamma M line is not zero. So that means that you have, um, let me go back for a second. That means that um, without any additional symmetry breaking external field, um, you have um, orbital moments which is only, can be only parallel to Z or anti parallel to Z. And spin orbit coupling, of course, ties um, your uh, actual spin with your angular momentum, and you get the situation where your spin and your pseudo spin and your orbital mo moment are all um, parallel to Z. Let me now discuss, uh, still a normal state, how the response to magnetic field proceeds in this interesting situation. Let me start first on this slide this is a non-relativistic case where we neglect spin orbit coupling entirely. The reason we are doing this is because we want to uh, do sort of sanity check. We know that uh, even though spin orbit coupling is strong on the superconducting energy scale, it's actually weak on the electronic scale. So we expect that, um, first of all, the anisotropy of the normal state spin susceptibility will be small, and it shouldn't be, uh, very different, should be actually very close to the, um, to the uh, non-relativistic susceptibility. So let us then consider the latter. So this is a schematic symbolic um, presentation of the uh, actual Fermi surface, um, Fermi contours of this material. Let me just remind you that there are these two spin orbit split contours around K and K prime, which are most interesting. And there's also, uh, uh, one um, contour around gamma, which I will be discussing less because it has uh, less interesting properties. So if you look at this, um, um, so this K and K prime are uh, related by inversion symmetry. Um, so this without spin over, they're totally equivalent. And uh, Kramer's degenerate. When we apply external field, uh, in that case, it doesn't matter along which direction, but we can just as well uh, select it along Z because there is no magnetic isotopy without spin orbit. And then, uh, then it becomes um, Zeeman split. So spin down Fermi source becomes slightly smaller in the same way around K and K prime and spin up Fermi surface becomes slightly larger around K and K prime. Um, by the way, what, let me tell one thing. Uh, I don't know how to follow if you raise your hand electronically. So let's now, let's be rude if you want to ask something just say loud a question, and then I will stop and we'll discuss your question, okay, if needed. So um, now the second part to, be, to remember is that um, this uh, experimentally accessible or um, um, experimentally accessible, uh, good word, um, magnetic fields are much smaller than this um, spin orbit coupling, uh, spin orbit splitting. So that's, uh, so this is a hierarchy of uh, energies uh, that both magnetic field and spin and superconducting energy is much smaller and the electronic energy is much larger. 
So when we subtract one Fermi surface from the other, what we end up with is, is this little ring around each pocket. Uh, and if you calculate the area of this ring, it's, it's a um, magnetic field times density of states for one spin. Uh, so double that, you get um, full density of states for two spins. Uh, times h, so that is Pauli susceptibility. In reality, there is, and we disc will discuss that there is a considerable um, stoner or um, Hubbard and en interaction enhancement of that, but um, without interaction, that's what we get. So how can we recover the same result if you actually include spin orbit? So let us first um, <coughs> uh, let us first look at what happens with spin orbit uh, and without magnetic field with the total magnetization. As you remember, magnetic uh, orbital um, moment is, uh, thank you, uh, orbital moment is parallel to Z. So that means that two uh, spin state and a uh, natural selection of quantization axis is also along Z. So um, if, uh, for, for instance, for this particular um, environment around uh, neighborhood of the key point, you will have splitting um, by plus minus uh, spin orbit coupling parameter. Um, and it actually will be opposite here because um, orbital operator will have opposite sign here. So if you look at that, you can see that each of these um, Fermi pockets separately actually have spin polarization because there is difference between spin up and spin down. And I'm saying spin, I mean pseudo spin. So, uh, but they cancel each other exactly. So as it should be, without external field, there is no magnetic moment. Now let's turn on a uh, field parallel to Z. Again, since um, <coughs> we add Zeman's, Zeman splitting with the opposite sign, so what does it mean? It means that my uh, red um, contours become larger, both around K and K prime, and my blue contours become smaller, both around um, K and K prime. So now I have uh, this balance between um, this large magnetic moment generated here and the smaller one generated here. And the difference is as easy to um, see is exactly the power susceptibility as we expect that in the lowest order in um, spin orbit, you don't have any change in susceptibility. Very interestingly, the response for H parallel to Z is numerically the same, but it's generated by a completely different mechanism. Indeed, in this case, there is no diagonal matrix element for the Eman operator. There's only non-diagonal. And it depends, um, <coughs> and the sign depends on where you're sitting here. So now what happens is that you're uh, in the lowest order because you know the eigenvalues in this situation are quadratic in H in perturbation. So the uh, position in the lowest order in, um, in H, the eigen energies do not change. So the Fermi contours remain what they are. So seemingly there should be no magnetic moment generated because this area is exactly equal to this area. And that is actually correct. But uh, magnetic moment is generated by different mechanism. Because we have relativistic situation, we have to take into account the G factor. Without magnetic field, the G factor was very simple. I had either uh, pure um, spin up state or pure spin down states. Now, uh, and again, as you of course all remember in the perturbation theory, while corrections to the eigenvalues are second order uh, in this in non-diagonal perturbation, the correction to the wave functions are first order. And that's exactly what they are. So the state which used to be pure up state now has a mixture of down state. And if you now calculate the uh, expectation value of the, um, of, uh, the um, of sigma x operator, sigma plus plus, sigma minus, then we get this number. And interestingly, that is correction, as you can easily uh, show by just diagnosing that the correction has the same sign uh, here and here. So in other words, this, uh, these spins are um, still largely parallel to Z. Uh, but they can't, they can't towards X and they can't uh, in the same way in both cases. Now, the spins that can't are 
only very only vanishing fraction of those pins are actually associated with the Fermi surface. Most of these pins are between the uh, these two Fermi contours, so they are actually removed from the Fermi level. They are removed by energy which is much larger than superconducting gap. So superconductivity cannot possibly affect anything uh, in this case. And if you do these calculations, you see just do a simple perturbation theory, then they end up with again with the same expression, the same Pauli susceptibility. This is, by the way, can be, uh, we can check that numerically by doing band structure calculations in external field. And it's very nice to see how it happens. If you have zero, zero, one field, which is parallel to Z, and you look at the K point, then um, it splits linearly. That's what we discussed. Uh, but if uh, you look at gamma point when there is no spin of the splitting, it just shifts a little bit. Mm. Now, if you look at this, uh, at the um, posi positions um, of the eigenstate at K, they're clearly quadratic. While for the gamma point, there is no difference between uh, two field directions. Now, what does it mean? Um, let me go back a little bit again. So you can see that this um, magnetic response is associated with the shifting of the Fermi level. That's what we cannot do in the superconducting state because there is no Fermi, Fermi surface. It's gapped. So whether we move it or not, nothing, uh, we cannot change anything. So and that's a mechanism by which um, superconductivity uh, suppresses magnetic response in normal PCS superconductors. This mechanism is completely operational here when we have um, when we have um, magnetic field along Z. So for that reason, the free energy of normal state supermagnetic state is different. And uh, if um, magnetic field, and so the potential magnetic uh, energy gain by generating magnetic response, um, which is chi times H um, squared over two, if that becomes larger than the pairing energy, roughly speaking, uh, then superconductivity is thermodynamically killed. We are speaking about thermodynamic critical field. However, <clears throat> because for the, uh, for the field parallel to the plane, the magnetic response is generated by electrons which are removed from the Fermi surface and cannot be affected by superconductivity, there is no difference. This is zero, which means that critical field is formally infinity. So uh, with that, in mind, and that will be mm, important for us later. Let us also look at the magnetic um, interactions in the mm, normal state. One fact that was um, actually it, um, the experiment had been done a couple of years ago, but for some reason completely overlooked. Nobody cared. And uh, the interesting result is that uh, for bulk, you cannot do it for monolayer, but for the bulk, experimentally measured spin susceptibility is considerably larger than the Pauli susceptibility extracted from the density of state. And uh, there are more good photo emission uh, and um, quantum oscillation data, uh, which show, which, so we knew that there is no uh, particularly um, noticeable uh, interaction, renormalization, driven renormalization of effective mass or something of that sort. So this is pure stoner renormalization, magnetic renormalization. So we performed uh, first principle calculations, and that's very simple. You fix the spin moment and calculate total energy. The second derivative of this energy with respect to magnetic moment gives you inverse susceptibility. We did it for bulk and for monolayer, and uh, we found that A, we uh, do overestimate um, quite noticeably uh, the, well, not, not but overestimate um, experimental stability, which is typical for itinerant um, magnets, uh, something like zirconia zinc two or nickel three aluminum, these sort of things. And we also found that in monolayer magnetism is quite a bit stronger, probably due to, um, to uh, lack of uh, not too small interlayer um, hopping. So that tells us that, of course, it's not a ferromagnet, but this material has tendency to become, to be close to ferromagnetism. So you may expect uh, spin fluctuations in this system. 
So um, the way how it looks on the simple RPA level is that this chi naught is Pauli susceptibility. And then there is interaction driven um, factor, which in Hubbard model is sort of is like Hubbard. Uh, you in uh, density functional theory is called stoner factor. It comes from um, mostly from cool rules interaction, but um, it's generally quite reasonably well described for a tinder system. So that uh, generates this enhancement. Now for itinerant magnets, the question of how that may affect superconductivity is uh, really ancient. It goes back to um, early 60s paper. Um, most detailed papers were by Fay and Appel in Germany, uh, although um, Berg and Schrieffer and uh, some other people contributed quite a bit. And um, in some particular, um, Again, this is always this question of how we select diagrams and so on and so forth. But for some particularly, particular seemingly reasonable recipe of selecting diagrams, um, and they got, and if you translate it into um, density functional language, uh, that's uh, roughly um, the potential pairing interaction coming from, um, from, from spin fluctuations. So as you can see, it's very important uh, to um, what becomes very important is the Q dependence of this interaction. From this experiment and these calculations, we only know that um, for Q0, we have considerable renormalization. So this factor is, uh, is sizable. What we do know, but if, uh, if it's not, if it's localized, so if, if it's not dependent on, on the wave vector, um, then it's um, largely provides just uniform suppression superconductivity with no particular interesting effect. Well, to this, um, so now uh, we will verify this assumption later, but now let's make an assumption that, that, uh, that it's actually close to ferromagnetism. That means that uh, the uh, spin susceptibility in reciprocal space and by, um, by, by the virtue of this formula, the pairing interaction or pair breaking interaction, if it's uh, depending on, um, uh, it has a peak around Q0. Now, the sharper this peak is, the more interesting would be the uh, features of these um, interactions related to superconductivity. Now, uh, let's discuss a little bit this now this, what kind of superconductivity can be generated in this system. So you might uh, see that there, so now we introduce notations. So this is K and this is K prime. They are related by inversion symmetry. Now we have two contours around each uh, point. One, is, one we call inner, the other outer. And as we discussed, um, when you go from K to K prime, the um, pseudo spin direction uh, is inverted. So we can have, in principle, scattering uh, of um, uh, electrons from uh, outer surface to outer surface. Uh, from K to K prime, and that would uh, require spin flip. So that would be allowed for, um, say, spin fluctuation mediated interactions, um, <coughs> similar from inner to inner. Then you would have um, inter, intra pocket, but interband scattering, uh, and that's also spin flip scattering. And then you would have um, <coughs> intra band intra-pocket scattering, which can be mediated by phonons. And of course, we can also have um, sc scattering in inter-pocket interband, say from outer to inner, um, from K to K prime, and that can also be mediated by phonons. So in this basis, we can think about two anomalous averages that appear in the problem. One would be the pair that is um, generated by two electrons on the outer, contour like this, and uh, it says something like this, uh, and the other by two inner electrons, something like that. Now this um, minus side is just introduced for convenience because it um, makes it easier to do some uh, arithmetics later. So uh, one thing which immediately comes to mind is that neither of these states is a singlet nor triplet. In fact, uh, both singlet and triplet are combinations of um, up, down, and down, up pairs. But we have only up, down, or down, up. 
and this case, this minus was introduced uh, to make them actually um, follow this convention. So in other words, you can say that the order parameter which is generated on the outer state is a sum of singlet and triplet components with the same weight, incidentally. And the order parameter generated on the inner surface is the difference between the two. Now, if these order parameters are actually equivalent, and remembering that this splitting is uh, small on electronic scale, um, we can say, well, if, this, if they are actually exactly equal, uh, then this, uh, for um, most, if not all experiments, you can imagine possibly, uh, but it's really hypothetical, some experiment related to scattering between inner and outer Fermi surfaces, something like quasi-particle scattering, but it would be nearly impossible to, to measure separately for everything else. In most experiments, um, the triplet components will just cancel out, and we will have material with a standard singlet property. The question, and it was actually assumed in a number of very good papers with, for good reason that this is a very good approximation. It is a good approximation. The question is how good? And you can think about that in terms of standard two-band BCS superconductivity. Uh, and this thinking was uh, mm, quite instrumental in magnesium diborite, in iron-based superconductors, and so on. So in simple BCS, this is the um, formula that you have. And uh, in linearized regime close to TC, you can even neglect that and you have essentially an eigenvalue problem um, for uh, this asymmetric matrix, which is symmetric interactional matrix times density of states. Um, the eigenvalues of this, um, um, the largest eigenvalue will define the highest TC and eigenvectors um, will define the ratio of, um, of uh, order parameters on in different bands. There are some things which are um, sort of intrinsic properties of this expression. Uh, in particular, if um, the order parameter, um, sorry, is if interaction matrix is uniform, in other words, um, as it quite often happens in um, electron phone conflict materials, if, um, if uh, interaction is weakly dependent on the, on the scattering vector, then anisotropy in uh, density of states does not matter, which is it's sort of easy to show that you will end up with the eigenvectors, which is just one, 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 all delta, all uh, order parameters are the same. On the other hand, if N is uniform, so let's say you have two um, set of bands, which in our case is it's, it's outer and inner uh, set of bands, if the density of states is the same, uh, and that's actually a good reason to believe that they are the same and they are very similar in the calculations because it's a two-dimensional system. In a two-dimensional system, density of states uh, does not depend on the size of the Fermi contour. So even if this Fermi contour is split and it's not split that small, the density of states is basically the same. So if density of states is the same, then uh, you have this equality um, when and only when uh, the diagonal parts of interactions um, are um, the same. And then uh, depending on what sign your um, interband interaction has, uh, that can be um, the phase of these two um, order parameters will be the same or the opposite. So in other words, if uh, in this interband channel, you would have for some reason, you would have um, repulsion instead of attraction, um, for instance, if spin fluctuations would dominate, which is unlikely, then you actually would switch sign, and then instead of having pure singlet, you would have pure triplet. For this particular material, it doesn't seem uh, to be um, to be possible, um, but that means that it's not possible at all in any uh, Ising superconductor. Now, if uh, on the contrary, only interband coupling in presence, then the ratio of the order parameters is, uh, oh, sorry, this is a type. It should be um, density, density of states of I. You know, what you, are, you do dry run several times and somehow always there are new typos that appear when you um, present it for the first time. It should be Ni over NO. Uh, but in any event, if, if um, density of states are mm, the same, then uh, the uh, ratio of the order parameters is also one or minus one. So now we are coming to these questions. First, since we have established 
that there are spin fluctuations in the system. And obviously there is electron phone coupling in the system because we know for a fact that this electron phone coupling generates superconductivity and the bulk. The question is in our system of notations, which particular scattering process can be ascribed to phonons and which to spin fluctuations or parameters. So this, um, so for phonons, uh, phonons can flip spin. So you can have either um, inter, as we discussed before, either intra band, uh, uh, intra band, intra pocket scattering, and that's for instance this scattering, uh, or uh, or this or or the same process inside. And you can also have inter band, inter pocket scattering, and that's shown by this green line here because it scatters um, without um, without spin change. Um, all other processes are forbidden. Uh, now for spin fluctuations, and let's say specifically that we want to consider um, thermodynamic spin fluctuations as the calculation suggests. Uh, <clears throat> then we can neglect uh, large wave vector scattering, which would be scattering from K to K prime and uh, K prime to K. So we set them to zero. And then there would be three other type of scattering and they will be, uh, it can be shown that they will be negative. They will have opposite sign. So um, what are the corollaries of that? If interband, intra-pocket scattering like this, spin coupling is stronger than, uh, stronger than interband, uh, inter-pocket coupling, which is unlikely, you will have pure triplet. If intra-band, intra-pocket spin or uh, phone coupling is very dispersive, then likely singlet is possible considerable triplet components. So why does that happen? Now look at this uh, blinking um, arrow and imagine similar arrow for the uh, inner pocket. You can see that this, that there is a, there's more um, larger wave vector on average involved in this scattering than in the um, interband inner uh, pocket scattering. Now, if uh, interaction is not very dispersive, they will still integrate to the same density of states by virtue of uh, two dimensionality. But if it's highly dispersive and at least uh, phonons are probably, uh, sorry, at least uh, spin fluctuations are probably highly dispersive, then you can actually have numerically different order parameters here. And then because of what we discussed before, um, there is a triplet component associated with the difference between these two order parameters. So um, can we put any quantitative uh, gauge on that? Well, very crudely, we can. Uh, if you uh, just suppose for simplicity, that your uh, interaction is distributed as a Lorentzian this way, uh, then you can integrate um, this uh, interaction uh, numerically, so numer analytically, and that's what you get. Then the difference between your net uh, coupling um, for inner and outer pockets uh, divided by um, the sum of them is proportional to uh, is defined by two parameters. One is obviously the uh, difference between these two, um, between the two uh, Fermi vectors, and the other is the sharpness of the um, of the interaction. If the interaction is not sharp at all, uh, so uh, um, psi is very large, uh, then uh, no matter how far apart these two things are, that's zero. If splitting is very small, spin orbit curve is very small, it's still zero. Um, in uh, naive diselenite, this uh, distance reaches about one third of Kf. In uh, related tantalum diselenite, which is heavier, it's even larger. So that's not that small a number. It's not large, but it's not small at all. Uh, and um, we have some, um, yeah, what we don't know yet what's going on for alpha squared f, uh, but they are, um, mm, mm, uh, Roxana margin has uh, some calculations which so far um, show that they might be uh, strong in interband channel, which is not very interesting for us, but it's not, uh, these calculations are not finished yet. Uh, about spin fluctuations, there is a very um, a simplistic way to calculate spin susceptibility, and we are trying to do it better now. But for the moment being, 
um, that's uh, Sergei Kmelevsky calculations. That's basically you assume that there is, um, you induce magnetic moment, small magnetic moment on each side, then calculate exchange constant in the real space. And then you from you can invert that and get um, some estimate of Q dependence of susceptibility. So these little uh, bumps here, they are coming from long range interaction, which is probably of RKKI origin. But the main peak is uh, at gamma, at Q0, and it's rather sharp. So I would say that uh, with this um, interaction in mind, that you can have 5, 10, maybe even 15% admixture of a triplet in this particular material, uh, simply because of spin fluctuations. Um, now, uh, do we have, going back, what kind of um, evidence we have the spin fluctuations uh, play a role in superconductivity. Then interesting argument, which um, very often is overlooked by both experimentalists and sort of analytical theorists, is that uh, the state of the art density functional calculations um, of electron phonon um, coupling superconductors has advanced to amazing uh, stage where the accuracy is within 15%. You may remember that several years ago, a nearly room temperature superconductivity was discovered at ultra high pressures and super hydrate. And the funny thing is that uh, the two, two best groups in the business, that Calander group and um, Cal Cal Calander and Maury group in Paris and, uh, um, and uh, uh, Hardy Gross group in Germany, they were sort of fighting with each other, uh, trying to understand why they have uh, errors of 15%. They both have, one group was blaming that on, um, on density of stage fine structure, the other on unharmonic correction. But uh, just to imagine that in this, uh, in 2017, we have um, completely first principle numerical calculations, which give you TC with accuracy of 15%, and people are um, fighting, trying to understand why they even have 15%. Mm, so uh, now when these same calculations, uh, have, were performed by several different groups for uh, naivum diselenite and the, and the sister compound naivum disulfide, they overestimate TC and delta by a factor of three to four, which is enormous error for such, for uncorrelated electron phone coupling superconductors. The only explanation of that is that there is considerable suppression of superconductivity already in the bulk by a factor of um, three, four. Now TC in the in single layer is about twice, nearly twice smaller. It's like from seven to four reduced from bulk. And actually calculations show that monolayers are closer to magnetism, which is also consistent. Now, if you take stoner normalization of 3.5, which is incidentally we take from the experiments for the bulk, that would, uh, by this naive uh, Fay apple formalism, that would lead to, um, mm, electron phone coupling, uh, electron paramagnon coupling of the order of one. Uh, that's really an order of magnitude estimate. It just says that it's probably, uh, maybe not one, but probably larger than 0 0.1 and uh, maybe something 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So this is not a negligible number, uh, no matter uh, which way you take it. So, um, with this in mind, if there are no questions so far, are they? I guess not. Okay, Igor, just you have about 15 minutes or so. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess we'll, yeah. I okay, mean, all right. I, I have some questions, but I would wait until the end because it's okay. really unrelated. Okay. okay, all right. So I'm switching again and telling about something else. This is a uh, relatively very new experiment and HIMAC, um, mm, kindly allowed me to show some of his results uh, here because they're very interesting and very exciting results. And from our point of view, um, provide a very good um, test case for theoretical um, concept. And what uh, they did, they created a, um, a, a heterostructure uh, tunnel junctions, which consisted of three layers of neuron diselenite uh, that's, a, uh, that's less icing than one, but it still has icing properties. Then three layers of chromium tribromide and again, three layers of neuron diselenide. Now chromium tribromide is an interesting material. It's a ferromagnet, 
uh, Van der Waals Ferromeut net, uh, which has actually all trihalides are um, um, also um, uh, trichloride and triiodine and ferromagnetic. Um, but uh, magnetic anisotropy in this material is actually not related to 3D ion, but it's related to the ligand. It comes from, there is no uh, single site anisotropy, there is exchange anisotropy only. And for that reason, magnetic anisotropy is um, growing rapidly with the atomic weight of the, uh, of the uh, halogen. And for chromium triodine, it's uh, pretty large. But for chromium tribromine, there is still uh, easy access on isotropy, but it's sort of weak ish. Uh, and, that, um, and that means that they can actually apply external field to this tribromine layer and rotate spins in a magnetic field of a little bit more than 0.6 Tesla, rotate spins in chromium tribromide from, um, from Z to in plane. Now, uh, because there is exchange bias between these materials, and we will come to the point how large this exchange bias really is, uh, they have some experiment, some estimate from experiment. Uh, we have some reason to believe that they are underestimating their exchange bias um, somewhat. But anyway, and there are many interesting things about that. We will, uh, in the remaining of the talk, we will talk about that. But um, uh, one of the, of several interesting things that I discovered was that they actually can measure um, delta in tunneling, and they can also measure like Dines broadening parameter, which essentially describes uh, the scale of pair breaking. And they found that if H is parallel to Z, um, God, that's another type, it should be perpendicular to Z here. So if H is parallel to Z, like here, then they have uh, considerable, um, I mean, not considerable, but very well measurable suppression of the gap and also of TC, uh, but the broadening is relatively small. When they actually rotate the field into the plane entirely, and that's here, then the gap is larger, but also broadening is larger. And that's very counterintuitive. You would think that if you suppress TC, you also suppress, um, you also make um, the um, density of states uh, broader, less sharp. That's uh, what happens for abrikosov garikov theory, for instance. So why does that happen? Let us first look at the, uh, what computations tell us about this system. So you can, um, first interesting thing is that you can place them on top of each other, but, uh, and you can, but to make them um, like coherent, you have to squeeze uh, chromium tribromine by 5%, which is a lot. We can do it in calculations, but it's not possible to do in practice. So in reality, these are literally two different uh, layers just simply placed on top of each other. Now, Phi believes that there is nothing in between at all. That may or may not be true. They definitely have very good surfaces, but not necessarily absolutely ideal. But if they had ideal sources, then we can optimize the distance. And um, we find, not surprisingly, that exchange bias generating in the top layer, that of course will be essentially zero when you go to next layer and next layer. So you have to Cooper pay will average over everything within the coherence length. Um, it uh, goes exponentially down. Now for the worst possible staking, and the worst possible staking is this, where your mm, bromine is sitting right on top of your selenium you get down to six milliwatts, which is still 100 Tesla, which is enormously large. The point here is that, um, first of all, as I say, that um, the real distance may be even larger. Uh, even more interesting, um, because it's incoherent that you can only have this uh, exact stacking on top of each other uh, at one particular point in real space. As you go away, uh, then these um, brown balls will start shifting with respect to, um, to, uh, uh, to green, light green balls. And um, eventually they would have to tunnel distance comparable to this um, distance. And because it's exponential, it goes down again. And uh, one uh, other thing which I will mention in passing is that uh, chrome, which was also uh, not very often pointed out, the chromium tribromine has very different gap in two spin directions, which leads to natural spin filtering. So in principle, you should be able to do this experiment not for SIS, but for SIM um, 
structure with a normal network and still see no exchange treatment, uh, which is a prediction of the theory uh, because of different spin filtering properties. One very interesting um, thing is that, again, we don't know and they don't know how exactly their layers are stacked. But if you try to put them on top of each other and start to rotate, you can clearly see a more pattern. Now, uh, this um, more pattern uh, changes has very different um, spatial scale, but this spatial scale is smaller or comparable to, um, to uh, coherence lengths, which is uh, as large as it believed in these um, monolayers. So that should lead to a number of interesting properties. Um, uh, scattering because the um, essentially Zeeman splitting is, is spatial inhomogeneous. So the first thing is of course that uh, Cooper pair will average effectively over this, but they might be also um, interesting scattering effects similar to scattering of um, of uh, vortex legacies, for instance. Now, how do we explain this experiment? Well, this explanation comes from a um, couple of papers by Maxim Hodas and his collaborator. And uh, while these papers are quite mathematical, the physical meaning is extremely simple. First of all, let's consider a, a Cooper pair without external field, uh, but with no magnetic impurities. So this pair cannot scatter from outer sources to inner source because that would, um, <coughs> that would require uh, uh, flipping spins. Uh, but it can scatter from outer surface to outer surface. Uh, but in, in either way, the both components will scatter the same way. So there will be no pair breaking. And that's essentially uh, just means that this is subject to Anderson theory. Now, if you have uh, H parallel to Z, then again, it's just exactly the same as standard BCS superconductor in weak external field. So there is Zeeman splitting. Because of Zeeman splitting, there is a uh, suppression of superconductivity, but there is no pair breaking in a precursor of work of sense. So uh, the TC is suppressed, by, but um, tunneling um, density of states becomes, remains sharp. And they can see that uh, in their calculations directly. The most interesting thing is when H is, parallel, is perpendicular to Z, so in plane, and you have pair breaking uh, scattering by non-magnetic impurities still. Uh, so what happens now is that you remember that we were discussing that uh, when we were talking about poly suitability. If you look at the um, <coughs> at the um, uh, lower uh, band, this lower band is canted uh, towards the field um, both um, around k and around k prime. So essentially, these spins are not collinear anymore, um, not anti-parallel. They acquire some triple component along the field. And the same, but opposite is true for the upper um, band. Now, if I look at these uh, two electronic states, this one and this one, then uh, they can scatter from one to the other without spin, flipping their spin because they have, um, they have spin overlap. So what does it mean? That means that now uh, that uh, scattering between um, up, down, and down, up Cooper pairs is allowed. And because they have different um, different phase in a way, so that becomes like uh, interband um, scattering in two band superconductor, or if you want, as uh, um, impurity scattering in a triplet superconductor. So this effect is proportional to the field because the more you can, them, the larger this effect, at least up to 45 degree canting, which is never reached in the experiment. Uh, for the reason that this interfocus uh, scattering is allowed. So there is suppression of TC, some suppression, uh, but even larger effect is broadening. So we believe, and we are uh, working on te technical quantitative now, that this effect that I was mentioning before, let me show it again, this effect is actually, so one reason why we think that this, uh, the estimate of, um, of uh, bias field is underestimate, uh, because in reality, it's not that, th that in this part of the diagram, you have no TC suppression, and in this, you have TC suppression due to Zeeman splitting. In reality, you have suppression due to impurities here, and you have suppression due to mm, impurities here, and in addition, you have suppression um, for, um, uh, and, and sorry, sorry. You have, you have uh, no Zeeman suppression here, you have only impurity suppression. 
you have no impurity suppression here, only Zeeman suppression. So what we see here, the difference is the difference between two suppression mechanisms. And impurity suppression is not small because we can see that uh, when this uh, impurity mechanism is in place, the borosinic becomes um, quite large. Uh, it's uh, something like uh, five, 10 percent maybe, um, but it's, it's quite noticeable. Uh, so uh, that uh, the working hypothesis is that there is impurities, there are impurities everywhere, but impurities are not effective in this state. Then they become gradually more and more effective as you rotate your, um, your spins. And then um, <coughs> here impurities are effective, but magnetic field itself, Zeeman splitting is not. So that explains um, essentially this paradoxical feature that gap suppression and uh, broadening uh, go opposite and not hand in hand. So I'm nearly finished. Uh, one thing which I want to discuss very qualitatively is uh, um, the very latest ratio, so-called pneumatic superconductivity. That basically right below TC, but not at very low temperature, uh, there is an isotropy in critical field which is not uh, C6, but, C, but C2. Essentially, you break hexagonal symmetry. So that was absorbed independently by two different groups and two different experiments, so that must be true. Now, there are two different theories accompanying these two experimental papers. So they essentially both introduce uh, what we call pneumatic superconductivity because it's a superconductivity which breaks the rotational or hexagonal symmetry. So uh, in Rafael uh, Fernandez theory, Mm, it assumes that there is a uh, internal strain due to the sample growing and so on. And then this strain, when combined with magnetic field, mm, breaks the rotational symmetry. In York's theory, there are, uh, it's an assumption, just an assumption, there are two uh, nearly degenerate order parameters. And then he shows that by fluctuating between these two order parameters, you can generate a pneumatic superconducting state. Those are both beautiful concepts. But unfortunately, uh, neither hypothesis, both paper essentially state that has any microscopic justification, even on uh, hand waving level. In addition, neither hypothesis, at least as long as we understand them, can explain why the effect is only absorbed just below TC and um, uh, not, uh, not at lower temperature. So what we are trying to work, again, that's another type, it should be C3 symmetry, um, or C6. Um, what we think that there are uh, extended defects here, which can be dislocations or grain boundaries, which na naturally breaks the symmetry. But uh, these uh, dislocations are uh, not really affecting uh, in any measurable way normal properties, but they do affect uh, superconducting properties through this uh, hottest mechanism that I just described, through this um, H-induced pair breaking. And uh, one uh, circumstantial evidence that the defects might be in place here is that in um, FIMAC experiment, they absorbed very unique feature and essentially magnetic field um, hysteresis, which only appears at about um, in supermagnetic state. And in fact, not even at TC, but a little bit below TC. Uh, so, um, and it does not, um, and there's no hysteresis in the magnet itself. It's, they can show that it's a proper superconductor. So that's how it goes. So this is this uh, history of the strengths. Um, so with that, I would uh, want to uh, finish and say that they are, um, first of all, the most important part of all I told is this uh, hierarchy of energies that we are working with magnetic fields which are much uh, smaller than, well, we can work at different, but we are with magnetic fields which are smaller or comparable to delta, but in both cases much smaller than spin orbit splitting, which in turn is much smaller than uh, Fermi energy and electronic energy scales. So um, because of that, you have spin spin directions and the Cooper partners are neither singlet or a triplet, only combination of them become singlet. There are various phenomena predicted theoretically. Some of them I touched upon and some I didn't. There is potential for maybe even tunable single triplet mi mixing. And the interesting uh, observation that many, um, um, I think, supernatural phenomena such, such as um, this uh, anomalously strong critical magnetic field anisotropy, they are rooted not in the uh, 
strangeness of the supernatural states, but inherited from the oddity of the normal state. And instead of conclusion, since we are talking about Ernst Ising, or now I should switch probably to Ernst Ising, because how, that's how he was born, just wanted to call your attention to a beautiful paper um, published three years ago on Kondmat, written by son of Ernst Ising and some other people around. Um, I love this photograph because I don't know if you know the story or not, but um, Ernst Ising was a um, student of Lenz, of Siegfried Lenz. And the Lenz was um, offered this problem of one dimensional um, um, Ising uh, model uh, to Ising, and Ising solved it uh, successfully, published the paper, and never worked in physics before. He actually wanted to be a teacher, and he taught uh, uh, in German school. Then, because of his Jewish background, he uh, had to emigrate to the States, and he lived the rest of his life in the States, uh, always being a school teacher. Uh, and another thing which I liked in that uh, previous quotation, which I, which I stole from this paper, is saying that let your communications be I, yay, yay, or nay, nay, but whatsoever is more than that, I would say, outside of Ising model, that comes from evil. All right, so let me stop sharing my screen then, and I can, okay. can now discuss. Yeah, thank you, Igor, thank you. Okay, so uh, now it's open for questions. Uh, uh, just if you have any, please unmute your microphone and perhaps better turn on your camera as well. Um, okay, so while people are thinking, maybe I'll ask one question I had. Um, in the old days, you know, I'm talking about like mid, you know, 80s when I was doing my PhD, et cetera, in our, you know, organic materials. But I remember there was a story about charge density wave. So this material, I think at least in the bulk, has charge density wave, which coexists with superconductivity. And there was a lot kind of interest in that. So is there a charge density wave? You know, is it, does it exist in monolayer or not? Yes. Or what's the story about it? Yes, it does exist in monolayer. There was a lot of controversy about that. There were some predictions uh, when uh, in those years when we couldn't really calculate that uh, too well, and I was involved in one of them, uh, predicting change of uh, wave vector. It later turned out that it was uh, just insufficient converged calculations. And now uh, it's known experimentally that the uh, charge density wave survives. It's the same as the bulk. The reason why people rarely inv in, invoke uh, charge density wave physics is that uh, there is experimental evidence. Uh, you can suppress charge density wave uh, by, mm, by uh, pressure, and TC just goes through this phase line without any change. So it does look, um, and it's a bit surprising because you would think that they should compete for the same density of state, but experimentally there is literally no change, not even a kink uh, there. Uh -huh. just, just to be clear, what's, what's transition temperature, roughly speaking, of charge density wave and superconductivity, just to have some idea? Uh, for the bulk, superconductivity is about seven, and charge density wave, uh, I don't fully remember. I think it's uh, several, uh, 30, 40 Kelvin, I don't mm -hmm. remember. It's quite okay, a bit okay. higher, it can be rapidly suppressed mm -hmm. by um, pressure. Yeah, by pressure, yeah. Uh -huh. And so all your presentation today was you know, in the absence of charge density. Completely wave, ignoring right? charge density. Okay. More yeah. of it was also ignoring largely the uh, Fermi surface pockets around gamma. Mm -hmm. It's less spin orbital. And it also has this interesting, you can say topological properties that there are um, spin orbit nodes um, along uh, gamma M directions. Um, that's an interesting addition, but for one talk, I thought that we should leave that uh, aside. Okay, and basically the conclusion about that, that experimentally speaking, this charge density and superconductivity don't seem to really interact. Uh, they don't seem to really interact. Much. I mean, it's still, yeah. the, uh -huh. we don't know for sure, but that seems to be the case. Just a, a kind of, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? Hmm. Okay. Um, Okay, so, well, if there are no questions, I mean, I give you a last chance, but, uh, um, but if there are no questions, then we can finish, close the meeting, uh, right? Okay, JP, do you have questions? Yeah, it's for, sure, why not? Hi, mm -hmm. Igor. Hi. Okay, so, uh, as I understand it, you're proposing a triplet component in uh, Nyoyun diselenide. Mm -hmm. Aside from this uh, recent experiment you showed, is there 
is there other experimental evidence that is consistent with that? I mean, I know well, it's- Well, I mean, first of all, this experiment uh, doesn't really tell you anything about possible triplet component. Uh, yeah. That's unrelated physics. And uh, that's another very good question. If there is a small triplet admixture, uh, how can we see that? And that's not clear at all. What about H, I mean, there's, there's a million studies on this. So what about HC2 studies or? Well, that, no, H, 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 HC2, uh, yeah, HC2 showed, uh, um, first of all, shows anomalously large anisotropy although not an infinite anisotropy. And that has absolutely no relation with whether it's singlet or it could be 100% singlet. It would still be the case. Mm -hmm. For the simple reason that uh, the, um, in the normal state, the um, spin stability is assembled from electrons which are not on the Fermi level. So similarity just doesn't change anything there. And yeah. then this magnetic field has no reason uh, to, um, True, and there's no Zeeman splitting in the lowest uh, order in H. So until H becomes comparable with spin orbit splitting, which is several thousand Tesla, um, it really doesn't matter. In fact, it's an interesting question is why it's still finite and not infinite. There are several explanations. One that I favor is uh, from um, Maxim Hodes and um, uh, David Mokley, and that ascribes that to, impure, to defect scattering. And these defects, um, it can be anything, even the surface scattering itself is a um, sort of interface scattering should, could be, could do the job. There's alternative explanations related to additional symmetry breaking uh, from the interface, which would, uh, in addition to Isaac term, would also add rush term. And in that case, there will be um, finite, um, finite things. So, but, I see. Uh, one other question, just about that experiment again. What was the thickness of the layers? Uh, three, three uh, I think most data were collected on Swiss 3.3. Three. Sorry? So three layers of diselenite, three chromium tribromine. Oh, three, three layers. layers, I see. Okay. Uh, three layers. So very thin, I see. Very thin, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, this is, uh, you can retain this uh, Isaac physics for a few modules, one, two, maybe three, uh, not maybe three, three for sure, uh, yeah. But then later, it very rapidly becomes bulk. Uh -huh. In fact, the critical they have um, they he was showing a picture when a critical temperature for single layer is four, for two layers it's uh, five point five, for three layers it's six, and for bulk it's seven. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. So that reminds me of this uh, another question I recalled. Um, so the the picture presented at the beginning the normal state spin susceptibilities, okay, mm -hmm. you know, depending on perpendicular or parallel, uh, then ma material goes, you know, superconducting, right? And if I understand correctly, spin susceptibility with magnetic field along Z should be suppressed more or less in the same way as- Absolutely, single, yeah. yeah. Right? Whereas way. spin susceptibility on the in-plane is not suppressed. I mean, more, it remains more basically the same, like sort yeah. of re re remi reminiscent of triplet. Right. No. So has this been measured? I mean, the change of spin susceptibility through superconduction transition. Yes, absolutely. That was the, that was the main experiment from that's That's how the whole thing started. Uh huh. Yeah. It would be nice, that, you know, to see the, the figures. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just, did, just, you know, it's only an experimental figure, but that's how the whole thing started. They mm -hmm. found that there was enormous anisotropy of critical mm -hmm. field. Basically for mm -hmm. uh, moderate fields, superconductivity was not suppressed at all. Mm -hmm. You had mm -hmm. to go to, um, yeah. it's like 10 times more than, than, than power limits. This was measured like by, is it like night shift by NMR or something else? Uh... No, you cannot, you cannot do NMR no. on, on no. mono layers. Sample is too small, yeah. I think it was just, I, I believe it's transport measurement simply. Uh, tra transport. I think, it's, yeah, I don't. Uh... Yeah, yeah. It's just, just to be clear, because you know, transport, transport is how TC depends on the field. What I was asking, how spin susceptibility well, uh, not directly. Yeah, no, uh -huh. that was, I don't think it was directly measured, but uh -huh. that's in a sense through thermodynamic relations, that essentially mm -hmm. is the same field because thermodynamic critical field is um, mm -hmm. proportional to the difference between susceptibility and normal and superconducting mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, fine, I see. So basically, direct immersion experiences with reality would be very difficult. Uh, you know, you, people usually, usually or often do it by night shift in MR, but because it's a single no, layer, that's, I guess, for impossible. One layer, for one layer, it's, it's, uh, yeah, you, can, yeah. you cannot do magnetometry. You can, uh -huh. even, even a normal state, stability is mm -hmm. not measured because you can Okay, okay. Okay, fine. So basically, what was measured is uh, to see how TC get affected yes. by a magnetic mm -hmm. field. Yeah, and strong, uh, strong is suppressed by perpendicular and basically not suppressed by parallel, essentially. Well, it's right? suppressed very weak, like 10 times weaker. Uh -huh. Okay, so that, that figure would be really nice to have, experimental figure at the very beginning. Uh, sorry, yeah, I should support okay. <laughs> But you yeah, know, you prepared it just for this talk. This is your first presentation, right? Yes. Uh, and usually, it's iterations, iterations after, you know. I agree, First yeah. presentation. Also, also number of typos. Yeah, typos, yes, yes. But that experimental figure would be really nice at the beginning. Yeah, so it would be really give the right. good motivation. Uh, for the story. Yeah. Okay. Okay, other questions? Okay, so if there are no other questions, then I guess we can close the meeting. Okay, so thank you very much for the attending and thanks for Igor again for coming, I mean, <laughs> virtually and giving the talk. Okay. Okay.